Hello, everybody. Good afternoon for those of us who are central. Um, I think only on the West Coast, we have some people who are just hitting noontime. For everybody else, I uh, hope your day has been good so far. Uh, my name is Desmond Martin. I am the program coordinator at Next Wave STEM, and it is my very great pleasure and honor to have each of you with us today as we discuss how to teach drones remotely. Um, it has been a week, <laughs> to say the least. Things are changing and happening rapidly, and they have been, um, not just this past week, but for the last few months um, with regards to COVID-19 pandemic. It has forced us into a situation where we have to continue to innovate as educators. And um, that means for a lot of us, teaching remotely. So we here at Next Wave STEM, um, we're really excited um, because we have had this opportunity to innovate, think in our feet, and develop a curricula that can be taught remotely at distance with your students with regards to drones, robotics, and 3D printing. Um, today, we're going to talk um, really in depth about ways in which we can um, get our students engaged, even if they're at distance, even if they can't get hands on with the technology. Um, we can really empower them to learn more about drones and how drones are used in everyday life. Before we get started, however, I do want to cover a few logistical um, concerns, just some house rules. Um, as I mentioned for our attendees who were on before our start, um, today we are in webinar mode. Um, that means that uh, we can't see your face and we can't hear your voice speaking into your microphone. We can, <clears throat> however, get more information about any questions, comments, and concerns that you might have via our Zoom application. Uh, I've got a feeling that everyone on our call today has become a Zoom expert in the last couple of weeks. Um, Q&A functionality is open. The chat is open as well. Um, I would also like to take a second just to pause and introduce my colleague, Sagundi Chigani. She is on the chat along with me. So that way, if you have any questions or comments that I don't see, she's there and she's gonna be able to direct those comments so that we can get your questions answered live on air. Now, the second piece of information I wanna to cover today is with regards to our Illinois educators. Um, those of us who are from Illinois and joining us today, we'll have the opportunity to claim the webinar as a professional development credit hour. Um, after today's webinar, I will be emailing everyone um, before the end of the business day, um, the participation certificate that is form 77-21B that you will need to submit to claim those PD hours. Uh, unfortunately, um, we do not align with the certification process for professional development in other states yet. But that's something that we are working on. And that same certificate can serve as your proof of attendance for today. Um, in that same vein, um, everyone who's participating with us today will be receiving a copy of the slide deck that I'm presenting from. And you will also be receiving a recording of today's webinar because I'm excitable. And when I get excited, I can tend to speak a little bit quickly. Um, I know sometimes we also have internet snafus. Um, if there's anything that you miss, we're recording it and we'll make sure that we get that to you as well. So with all of that being said, we will go ahead, jump in and get started. And an awesome place to begin is at the beginning. And the beginning really for Next Wave STEM is who we are as a company, what we believe in and why we're here. Um, we're here because we recognize, like many of you recognize, that we are facing some massive problems um, in our world, in our society. Uh, and those problems are going to require, in a lot of instances, some technological solutions. Um, before, we had a global pandemic that required some technological innovation to help deal with. Um, we were dealing with and are continuing to deal with climate change. Um, we have climate refugees in the United States right now. Um, we have issues of potable drinking water, and we have issues of traffic density, and we have incidents of food waste, and we have so many overarching problems that we are hopeful 
that our understanding of STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics will, will give us some real meaningful solutions. What we've also recognized, however, is that we need more scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians in order to develop some of those solutions. And we believe that children, our next generation, are going to be those people to solve those problems. Uh, in order for us to do that, we know that teachers have to be empowered to teach um, emerging technologies. That's why our courses are designed to be K through 12, um, exposing students to drones, robotics, computers, and artificial intelligence, 3D printing. Um, the goal for us is to get your students exposed and proficient with some of these skills so that by the time they move on to high school or they move to that college degree, they know that they belong in the field. They know that they're capable. They've already worked with the technology extensively. And they, they can really get in there and start making some change, start making some noise, start solving some real problems. Um, the phrase that I like to use all the time is that we want to transform our students from being the consumers of technology solely to also being creators of technology so that we can solve some real problems. So in that vein, um, today we want to focus on you as a teacher and thinking about ways that we can expose our students to flying drones in classrooms, or not even in their classrooms. Um, well, it depends on how you think about the word classroom. If they're at home, the home has become a classroom. So yes, thinking about ways to fly drones in their classrooms, in their homes, but also in your classroom, um, ways to get them involved. And we're going to be using the Tello EDU application to accomplish this. Um, after we talk about tangible ways that we can use drones um, remotely, um, we also want to focus on um, things that you can do to teach this hands-on technology. Um, that's where we dig into the idea of an effective remote learning instructional model. Um, what does it really look like to conduct a lesson with your students? Um, via Zoom or via Google Hangouts or whatever your digital communication tool is. Um, what does it look like to actually execute that lesson and have your students learn? So the first thing you want to do is understand the coding environment. Um, this is where I get the opportunity to introduce you to our tool, um, Tello EDU. It is the application that we use um, that connects to the physical drone that students might have access to in your classroom or on their own end. Um, but it also gives us the really special benefit of some features that make remote learning flying drones possible. So for those of us who may have never even heard of the Tello drone or Tello EDU before, um, this is Tello EDU. This is the icon. I, it is free to download. Um, some of you may be even downloading the application or checking it out on the iOS or Android stores right now. Um, Tello EDU is a scratch programming interface for drone flight. Instead of your students having to figure out how to write in complex languages, say JavaScript or even Python to make their drone fly. Um, they're able to understand programmatic knowledge, use point and click, drag and drop coding, and push those instructions to their machine. Uh, we're teaching them some really important fundamental um, computing basics uh, while connecting it to an emerging technology for autonomous flight. So we're really getting the best of both worlds when we think about the ease of access to the actual coding, and then the application to a robust piece of equipment. Tello EDU also gives us the added benefit, really, really powerful for remote learning, of simulation. If we don't have the drone, if we don't have it connected to the, um, to the actual, um, drone, drone, then we can actually see what the drone would fly like in the simulation. Um, I just got a message from Chip letting us know that uh, I'm not in presentation mode. So all you can see is the first screen. Chip, thank you so much for catching that one. I'm going to change over. 
and share the new screen. Uh, can you all let me know? Can, do you see a Tello EDU icon, an orange icon right now? I think we should be set up here. Yes, thank you so much. Chip, Chip, you are the gold star student today helping me out with the webinar. Uh, this icon is the Tello EDU icon, and this is the application that we're going to be able to use to program and fly our drones um, both remotely, um, autonomously, and virtually via simulation. And don't worry, uh, since we did have that snafu, you missed a couple of slides, but nothing catastrophic. Um, I'll remind us that we are getting a copy of the slide deck today, but we're also getting uh, the recording, um, not only of today's webinar, but of the webinar series generally. Um, we have fortunately run this content before in last week's webinar, so we'll be able to refer to that for our records and for our edification as well. And we're just going to press on forward. So before we really jump in depth into the way that Tello EDU works with our drones, and when we do that, I'm actually going to flip over to the application so that we can see it live. Um, it's useful to establish um, what a drone is, what a drone actually physically is. And one way we can think about what a drone is, is what a drone does. Um, a drone really is just a very simple word for flying robot. And just like a robot, um, when you fly that robot, when you give that robot instructions, you're making that robot take some kind of action on its own. A robot performs physical work, uh, applies a force to itself or to another object and causes it to move. Um, in this case, um, that robot is moving itself, flying from point A to point B, and it's using some, its sensors to follow some simple instructions, some simple directives. Um, generally speaking, that instruction is go from point A to point B, go from here to there. So uh, this slide was actually cut off a little bit, but I want to reframe this question. Um, what is an example of ways that drones are being used currently? Um, I know that there are a bunch of different things that we've seen drones be able to do. Um, I can actually model this a little bit and share something I've seen in the last couple of years, which is a really beautiful use of drones. Um, the Paradise Fires in California, Northern California a few years ago, um, we see drones being used in those situations to actually scan infrared and look for human beings and livestock and uh, other animals that might be trapped via those fires. Um, the drones become an extra set of eyes to detect things that we wouldn't be able to detect. So we see fire departments using drones more and more for search and rescue. Um, but I wanted to shut up myself a little bit for uh, the opportunity for you to share. Um, what are some things that you can imagine drones being used for uh, in a day-to-day -day or even emergency situation? And um, we'd love to hear your input in the chat. Uh, Tim, yes, um, spraying crops agriculturally. We're thinking about actual pesticides or pest reduction. Um, we're seeing drones used in that case um, for fun. Uh, flying drones is lots and lots of fun. Uh, I've flown a couple of drones and it is really important to see um, the ways in which fun and science get used. Um, Sagundi chimed in for making deliveries, package deliveries, more and more. CPS is doing tests. Amazon has been flying package deliveries for a couple of years. Um, Tim again, taking pictures. Um, one of the most uh, most common uses for drones is in the videography and photography. 
Um, Brandon chiming in, hotspots on fire, search and rescue, mapping, um, infrastructure, COVID testing sites. Yes, drones have become um, integral in all these applications. Um, and this is a really good exercise because a lot of times we will try to engage our students and um, get them excited about an emerging technology or something that we want to teach. But in the back of their head, they're always saying, what's the application? When am I ever going to need this? How am I ever going to use it? Um, for drones, it's something that we want to make tangible for our students right away. So the example that I like to bring up in particular is using a combination of our tools. Um, we'll have the application. We have the actual uh, way to interface with our drones and the code with our drones. So we'll get to that just momentarily. And we also have open source mapping um, available to us to allow us to simulate some flight scenarios. Um, Google Maps, Google Earth, for those of us who are in the Apple ecosystem, Apple Maps um, lets us know information about distance and we can take that information and then use that to simulate some applications for flights um, in the real world, whether that's around our, our, our house, um, whether that's flying in a park, um, and think about ways that we can use these drones in some very creative applications. So what I like to think about is this plan for exploration for our students. Um, and in this situation, we take our open source tool and we teach how to use it. Um, something that our students might not know all the time, even though um, they interact with it very often, is how to use a map. Um, that bar scale in the lower right-hand corner of Google Maps becomes very, very powerful. Um, if I were flying my drone, or if I wanted to fly my drone around the park, um, I would have to tell my students, okay, what kind of considerations do we need to make? Um, what kind of instructions do we need to give the drone with respect to distance and how to fly around the park? So at this point, I'm actually going to change uh, my screen so that we can take a look at the drone application. Right now, we should be able to see um, this home screen for Tello EDU. Um, this application is actually going to give us the ability to connect with a real drone and make that drone fly in a given area, but it also gives us the option to simulate. Before we even get the simulation, it's useful for us to see the actual block coding in place. And in order to do that, I'm just going to click on this green puzzle piece. Now, some of us as educators may be familiar with block-based coding. Some of us may be familiar with Scratch. Um, it becomes a really powerful tool because instead of actually having to write out individual commands, instead of being consumed about whether or not I put the right semicolon in some place or if I'm missing a bracket, um, it kind of takes the actual form out and really focuses on the logic and the function. And it does that via puzzle piece blocks. So when I click on that motion block, I have examples of all kinds of different physical motions that my drone might be able to take. Um, and we can kind of go down a list and expand upon what our drone is able to do based on programmatic knowledge as well. Um, we have, of course, a takeoff. I'm going to pull this block out. And we just drag and drop for our students. They can do this on a cell phone. They can do this on an iPad. They can do this on a Chromebook. There's complete drag and drop, connecting the commands to each other. And when they press that button, tap to start, it causes the command to actually run. And it's just that simple. And for our students, let's say they're coding and they're working with their drone, they want to give their drone the instructions so the drone does what they wanted to do. Um, they can find themselves in a situation where they might grab something that they don't understand or have made some kind of mistake. Well, anytime I'm manipulating one of these blocks, we have the added benefit of being able to delete anything just by dragging and dropping over to the left. Really, really simple, really useful. 
clicking on our different menus gives us access to our programmatic knowledge uh, and logic. Um, we can repeat certain strings of instructions um, indefinitely or for a uh, limited amount of time. We also have the ability to do if then statements and break out of our code as well. And um, these green hexagons let us know that we can also engage in Boolean um, if then else statements as well that give us some powerful things that have happened. So I'm going to jump down in this minion over to operator and that becomes our mathematics portion. Um, this becomes really, really useful because we can get very, very fine tuning with regards to the drone's flight, but we can get very, very fine tuning with regards to what the drone is able to react to because we have access to the drone sensors. Um, connecting to our drone gives us the ability to measure specifically um, the amount uh, that the drone is pitched um, using my hand here as a demonstration how much the drone is tilted forward or backward how much the drone rolls how much is tilted to the left and right um, how much the drone is yawing that's our aeronautical term for rotation so that um, raw that rotation about the z-axis kind of like a top spinning and the accelerometer the same thing that lets you know that your phone is moving or that the screen needs to change is also the drone letting the drone know how much it is accelerating in the forward and backwards direction, the X in the left and Y direction, the Y in the up and down direction, which is the Z. Um, our drone also includes a sensor to measure um, temperature. So we can measure the minimum or maximum temperature and code dynamically based on what the temperature is as we're flying. Um, and our drone also has a laser range finder, which allows us to know how far we are from the ground, really useful for when we want to land a drone, but also a barometer so we know how far we are in the air column. Um, FAA regulations say that we are, are uh, unable, or it is illegal at least, <laughs> to fly our drone above 400 feet in the air. That's useful information to know. Connected to the drone at any time, clicking on this information panel on the right side of the screen will cause us to get a live look at the sensors of our drone. So at any time we can really see what our drone is doing with the direct feedback from the drone. Um, so really, really powerful to get this direct sensory feedback as we want our drone to fly. So all this is great, all this is cool, um, all this is fine, but okay, that's only for if I'm connected to the drone. Um, what do I do if my students don't have the drone? If I don't have the drone, um, well, the first thing you would do is get in touch with us and we can gift you those drones for your classroom. Um, but if that's not gonna work for you, then we can simulate our drone flight. And the way we simulate our drone flight, I'm gonna drop this menu back down, is to hover down here towards the bottom of our screen. I'm gonna close our flight information. And there is a little eyeball icon. Clicking on that eyeball icon causes us to get a simulated drone environment. And here is where we can get nice and close and see what our drone would look like in the real world. Um, we're in a virtual world. I, I don't think we're gonna be near any pyramids here in Illinois, um, but <laughs> what we do have the ability is to see the drone move in three-dimensional flight. So a simple command shows us that after the drone has taken off, I might tell the drone that I want it to fly forward. 100 centimeters, um, everything is metric. We find that to be a much more useful um, units of measurement system considering the nature of aeronautics. Um, I might program in a left yaw so that we can see a little bit better idea of what that yaw actually means. And then I'm gonna program in up. I want to try to get this drone moving amongst all three axes if I can so we can get a better sense of the way this drone moves through the air. So I'm going to press tab to start. That will cause the drone to take off in the air, go forward, rotate, fly up some more. And now 
we think through our programmatic knowledge because I'm intentionally missing an instruction. Uh, and this will happen to you in the classroom as well. If we don't tell the drone to land, it won't. It will hang in the air um, as my drone is currently doing. Um, our virtual environment shows this little carrot, um, this three-dimensional arrow that's uh, bobbing. Um, that's indicating the direction, the forward direction of the drone, the direction that the camera on this drone is pointing. Um, but in this case, we've executed these four instructions, but we forgot that the drone needs an instruction to land. So what I can do is actually include that instruction to land here at the end and run that code again. And then our drone will execute that landing. Really point blank, dead simple coding for our students. Those five instructions um, on the first day, they can see a drone in action. And one thing I can show off here is just the way that these blocks really intermesh with each other. So I can tell my drone maybe to repeat the set of actions after it's tape, it's in the air. And if I'm very good at grabbing the blocks that I want to grab, I can actually tell it to do something repetitively. We'll tell it to land. And instead of 10 times, let's, uh, for the purpose of demonstration, I only do three. So tap in the start, that puts our drone in the air. And I can even rotate our camera a little bit so we can get a little bit more of a three-dimensional view of what's happening here. Our drone is just receiving the instructions that we push towards it and being clever, understanding, programmatic, logic. Um, we can pretty much make the drone move any way that we would want the drone to move. So now I'm actually going to jump back over into our presentation. Because the ability to make the drone move allows us to have this ability to explore uh, and even imagine in real world scenarios what we might want our drone to actually do, how we want it to move. If I want my drone to patrol a park or fly to four corners of a park if I've never been there before, or maybe I lost a pet, um, how can I get that drone to move and go where I want it to go? Well, it all comes down to understanding logically what we want to have happen. Um, our drone natively in terms of its controls has a limit to how far um, the drone can fly. Um, if I try to put a value over 500 inside of any of those motion blocks, um, it's gonna kick back a nominal value of 28 to me because 500 is a bigger figure than um, the memory is going to process for that particular block. But using operators, understanding how much I want the drone to rotate and what kind of distances I want the drone to fly, I can program in a, an example of a flight path that the drone would be actually able to take in real life. So uh, I've kind of done this in the example of a cooking show. Um, and what we have here is a simple set of instructions to make the drone fly uh, around this particular part. Um, we've done a little bit of math and we've converted the actual distance in the bar um, scale in the lower right hand corner of our map. Um, and we've estimated the distances that the drone needs to fly based on the lines we've actually been able to drop on our map. Um, this is an example of something that we, we actually do in our curriculum at Next Wave STEM, teaching your students how to use maps teaching them how to convert those imperial map units into um, the metric units um, used to fly the drone. And then we actually give them this blueprint of, okay, here's the example that we use to fly a very basic geometric pattern around this park that is actually used for um, an actual application, exploring the park, surveilling the park, searching the park. All those things can be accomplished using these drone flights. Um, and it was less than 10 instructions. It is uh, maybe 15 blocks total 
um, that we snapped together and nested together to get our drones to be able to do what we wanted to do. Um, that becomes really, really powerful for us. So the drone itself is something that we can simulate, we can connect to a real drone, get the drone flying in the real world for our students who have access to the drone or get access through you as teachers for the drone technology as well. But this also becomes this powerful learning example because um, this is really, really bare bones. Um, we have this lingering question, this place to go from of what other information do we need to know to complete the flight? Um, well, this map is really, really useful for knowing where space is, but doesn't tell me a lot about what's in the space. Um, most parks are green because there's grass, but also because there's other things like trees. Um, do I understand the three-dimensional space in the park? Uh, we saw that our drone moves not just left, right, up, and down, but also flies uh, forward and backward in three-dimensional space and has the ability to fly in trees. Um, how do we navigate those concerns? Um, those are things that we dig into in our curricula as well. So I know that was a, a, a lot there. Um, I want to pause for a little bit just in case there are any questions about the drones. I'll give it just a, maybe a brief 30 second pause um, because I know I did show quite a bit. So if there's anything that I that you want to dig into more specifically for the drones, uh, I want to give you the chance and I'll open up the Q&A and the chat for that right now. And believe me, there is no such thing as a bad question. Oh, so Gundy asked a question. Uh, what's an appropriate age for students who want to start working with tele and or drones? Um, great question. One thing that we also prize ourselves in at Next Flight STEM is this ability to establish a drone as not being a toy, but a tool. Um, we found that students um, with proper instruction, even as young as first grade, can really use these drones very safely. Our drone courses are designed to start at third grade, um, and that's a really great place to start to really teach them about the technology in a way that doesn't become scary but becomes really useful. Uh, Tim, I agree. Block coding is a great way to learn. Um, uh, drone flight, but a great way to learn programming in general, a great way to give machines instructions. Um, Sagani so already answered a really good question. Uh, Tello.edu um, is free. Um, you don't have to download anything. You don't have to pay for anything. Um, you don't have to download the program specifically to a computer. It will work on Chromebooks. It will work on Android tablets and iOS as well. So um, that's a really, really good question. Uh, and I would also encourage you to check out more about the Teledrone itself. Um, there is a software developer kit for those of us who are looking for droning um, that is uh, more advanced for our programming students. Um, the software development kit allows us to fly drones um, with Python. So for our students who are a little bit further ahead in their computer science education, um, that becomes a useful tool as well. Um, and Mr. Freeling, we're going to make sure that we get you that URL. I don't have it off the top of my head. Sagundi may have it, but we're going to send you that link uh, a little bit later. Oh, I do have another question here. Um, yes, the curriculum that we provide does include some light assessment. Uh, it is mainly supplemental, but there is assessment there so that you can track your students' progress, especially when it relates to their comfort to the technology. Um, really good question there. So at this, um, it's really useful to, for us to think about what becomes an effective distance learning um, model. Yes, I might be able to understand the technology. 
I might have the opportunity to get it in my students' hands. Um, but how do I teach this? What does this look like in the classroom? Uh, especially if I'm working with students 25, 30, maybe it's only a dozen, maybe it's only eight or nine. However many students, how will this work with respect to teaching it online? And the next phase term, um, what we've developed is really the 5E instructional model. Um, it is something that I'm really excited about bringing into the classroom um, because it allows us to take things that we've done effectively in the classroom, in person, hands on with the technology, and engage the digital tools and skill sets that you already have as educators. Uh, just had another question. Um, do y'all have complete curriculum for to the 12 grades? Uh, Great question, Brandon. The answer is yes. Our curriculum for high school in 3D printing and drones is there to really help supplement what your students are doing at those 10th, 11th, and 12th grades. Uh, I'm going to connect you with uh, um, co-moderator, Sagundi. She's our school partnerships manager, and she's going to be able to give you some more information about uh, the curriculum scope and scale. So our 5E instructional model, engage, explore, explain, and elaborate, and then evaluate. It's really born out of what we would actually do in the classroom and augmented by the tools that we have for digital learning as well. And this is an example of what that actual progression looks like. Um, we'll dig into this more step by step, but this would be kind of your overarching blueprint with respect to how your course would be conducted each individual class session. Um, when we think about engaging, it's really about our live instruction, that, that thing that you get amped up and excited about as a teacher day to day. Um, and it, it brings out this overarching question of how do we engage a real world problem with our students? Um, working in STEM, um, in the past, it's been an abstract. Um, one tree leaves Santa Fe at 12 p.m., another leaves Denver, at 3 p.m. at what time will they meet? At what time and in what location will those chains meet? Um, our students don't care. <laughs> they they want to do things that are exciting to them and that impact them and that are real problems that need to be solved for them. So that's where we connect um, the technology to something that's happening in the real world. Um, from there, it's whole group collaboration. Um, bringing the classroom online digitally, um, something that's moderated by you as an instructor as you're exchanging ideas and instructing in your particular technology. Um, for those of us who have tools that allow small group collaboration, breakout rooms, chats, um, that becomes a place where your small group instruction and teamwork gets reified. Um, you see leadership from your students when you have the ability to interact with your students um, directly in those small group settings. Um, Oddly enough, in even a more intimate way, because kind of the the chaos and the din of the classroom environment fades away. Um, we go to live group instruction and moderating once again, where we share ideas about prototypes and solutions for the problem that we're working on. And then we give our students the opportunity to share their independent work. Um, what have you observed about this process? Um, what solution are you going to attempt to build in the code or in the way that you're actually going to set up the code execution? Um, what needs to ch be changed? And of course, we have our tools. If we're a Microsoft 365 school, um, we've got the Office Suite available to us. But if we are also a Google Classroom, um, as our LMS, we can do live input um, through Docs, through Sheets, through Slides um, to give feedback back, both individually and as an entire class. And after that, we're also leveraging that technology solution in our LMS, our learning management system, whether that's Moodle or Schoology or Google Classroom, once again, or Accord, um, that allows us to um, not only assess, but really give individualized, personalized, lower pressure feedback for our students to um, interact and engage with. So I know we talked a little bit about it before, but not only do we think about actual, actual problems, actual things that the drone is able to do, 
but we also have the ability to think about um, the things that we can solve, like real tangible things that we're able to take care of with our drones. And in this context, of course, it's COVID-19. Um, we're practicing in citizen engineering, solving uh, real world problems for other parts of our society using the technology. Um, we understand that drones are a great way to maintain social distance um, and they're able to deliver some essential, essential items for people who need them. Um, if there are people who are struggling with a medicine delivery, um, we've seen medical deliveries being done by drone in remote um, locations in developing countries for the last couple of years now. More and more, we can see communities that are disconnected from resources receiving the um, medication and other essential goods that they need via drone delivery. Um, but we can also think about drones being uh, assistive protective devices, those things that separate us from touching those high traffic surface um, surfaces that have the potential to get us sick. Um, our mail carriers are social distancing, but it's useful to have a drone that can go out and collect and collect the mail or have a drone, and I've seen this um, here in Illinois, have a drone that gives us the ability to social distance from people by walking our dog. Um, it was really, really weird to see how comfortable a canine can get with a, with a, a drone flying the dog on a leash, but um, it is something that has been done. Um, it, it, it is a powerful, powerful way for us to solve some real pressing problems um, and expand upon the way that we solve problems in the future. From there, we go into to explore. And um, I like to say all the time that collaboration will become key when it comes to the way that you interact with your students right now. Um, we're thinking about knowing our tools. Um, at this point, I don't think that's going to be so much of a concern for our, our teachers. Um, you know how to use Zoom. You know how to use Google Hangouts. Um, but also, really become a master at it. Learn how to effectively share your screen, effectively share other screens. Don't be like me and forget to share the presentation screen instead of uh, just the beginning of your slide deck on, Google, on, on PowerPoint. Um, know how to do things like allow for annotation. Um, for some of us, we're a little bit better at those things because our classroom overhead, those digitally collected, um, digitally connected projectors allow us to do screen sharing and screen mock-up. Um, things like AWW can draw our latex. Um, we want to become masters at them and empower students to use those tools more effectively as well. Um, there will be lots of professional development in the near future for that purpose. When you think about explaining, I mentioned this earlier before, document collaboration becomes a super powerful tool, both for our whole class uh, and for our small group and individualized instruction. Um, it's really an amazing thing to give your students um, assign your students a Google slide presentation for the whole class, a class slide presentation, and allow them all a single slide that they're going to take notes on. Um, not only are your students going to be able to compare their notes in real time and think about um, what they're seeing, what they're taking in, their thought processes that they have and can share with each other, um, it gives you insight in real time as an educator into the thought process for your students. Um, especially if it's reactive and responsive. Um, so that document collaboration gives your students the opportunity to explain and share with you more of what they know. Um, you want to give your students the opportunity to elaborate and evaluate, and that's where your learning management system becomes more powerful. Um, many of you are doing really, really great work already when it comes to assigning and receiving those assignments on Google Classroom or Canvas or Moodle, and the ability to download and save screenshots and download and save actual programs, whether they're in text or in specific files, all that can live in your learning management system. So now specifically um, that we've covered like the really big meaty part, um, the fire hose of information as I like to say, how to actually use the technology and how we can use it for remote learning, but also thinking about what your classroom session looks like, how um, you're going to interact from your, with your students from class to class, how can next wave students specifically help. And this is actually where I'm going to tag in my colleague Sagundi 
uh, to talk about what Next Fate STEM does and how we can do that more effectively for you in your classrooms. So Gundy, take it away. Awesome, thank you, Des. Um, so yes, uh, following Des's awesome presentation is always uh, a little bit daunting for me, but I'm just gonna jump right in here and start talking about what we're doing. So as you've attended right now, uh, we are doing a bunch of free PD sessions throughout the summer that, uh, that Des leads. I know that many of you have been to um, many in the past as well, so hope to see you in the future as well. Uh, the other thing that we're doing, which is um, our newest offering, is we are offering online classes. So for these classes, we have students take them with equipment. So that means that they would purchase a drone, a robot kit, or a 3D printer. And then our instructor would pair up with them uh, and a couple other students as well and walk them through that curriculum. Super hands-on, super engaging. Um, really great way to get students sort of uh, preventing them from getting that summer slide. Um, going on for the summer. And then our other option is the online experience. So this is also a fantastic option. It's for anyone uh, who wants that exposure and has internet access. And so, you know, just like the students have been doing remote learning, ours is uh, similarly structured in that they'll get this online experience. Um, our teacher will walk them through, you know, just like Des walked you through using Tello uh, for the drones and then other applications like Tinkercad if they were to do 3D printing and things like that. We've had some really great success around this and kids, we've had you know 10 year old boys come back to us and say, hey, I came back uh, from my bike ride so I could come to your class because the last class was so great. And so we've had some really good feedback um, from students you know, as young as um, I think eight years old, um, all the way up to high school for all these online classes as well. So if you're interested in that, feel free to drop either of us a note. Um, we're getting a lot of interest from campsites and stuff like that too for the summer's virtual programming. So we'd love to work with you all and see if we can get more of this stuff in front of students this summer. Thank you, Des. Thanks so much, Sagundi. Really appreciate that. Um, and I wanna echo what Sagundi just said. Um, we are trying to provide options that are gonna work both for your in-person needs for students um, when and where they'll be able to come back in person, whether that's over the summer or for the fall, but for your students that are still doing distance learning, um, we're doing a complete bundle. Um, we're doing the curriculum, we're doing the training for you. Six hours of professional development training um, for our Illinois educators, uh, as well as equipment bundles so that you have what you need, um, kitten computer out of the door. Um, for those of you who are on the webinar today, um, we have your registration information and that makes uh, a discount on that bundle available for you at any time following the webinar today. Um, so we really, really want to make sure that you have what you need um, so that you're prepared to go teaching STEM effectively in the fall. So yes, lots of information. Um, want to pause for a bit because there may be some questions about either programming with drones or flying the drones or even in the way NetSway Sim can get you drones and curricula. Uh, any questions that you have right now, I want to pause and make sure that we get those answered live on air. Oh, Tim, great question. Do we have an FAA remote pilot certification course? Um, that's something we have explored in the past. Um, we do not currently have that course. Um, the course is available for students who have um, stable internet connection, can go to FAA.com, um, but we're still working on that course. Um, not currently, but something that we're looking forward to in the future. Very good question.
we've gotten some great questions so far. Yes, I agree. Awesome way to learn with the simulator. Well, I know that there was quite a bit of information. If you've got any other questions, um, you can absolutely reach out to us at any time. Um, that is my face there in the middle. I'm Desmond Martin, uh, Desmond at nextwavestem.com. Uh, my colleague is Sagundi Chigani, uh, Sagundi at nextwavestem.com. Uh, Sagundi is gonna drop her email in the chat box. Um, if at any time you want to connect with us, we are active on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, we're here to serve you. We know that your students really need a high quality STEM, not just because it's fun or because it's something that's good to know, um, but because we want to see them solve some incredible problems. Um, we believe that they're incredible people. We know that you as educators are creative, creative incredible problem solving people as well. And we are so, so glad to be a part of this mission with you. Um, so with that being said, um, thanking you once again for being with us. We're wishing you uh, safety um, still, even as we're dealing with the pandemic. And um, we are looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much everyone. And we will talk to you later.